When eSports pools invited me to work with them, I told them that integrity is of the utmost importance to me. So when they're offering their betting services and fantasy eSports, there could be no bias in how they gauge who's more likely to win a game. Because the people who place bets there and take advantage of their revolutionary features, like live in-play betting, need to know that no team is going to be unfairly favoured just simply because they're liked by you. Now, thankfully, they said, of course, we understand and we, like you, are entirely objective and independent. And that's why I can trust them for fantasy and esports betting. Cloud9 has won the E-League Major Boston, the 12th CSGO Major, and it is the first ever major title for Cloud9 for any of their five players. In fact, this tournament was the first ever playoff berth for four of the players, basically everyone except Tarek, and none of them had ever been to the semifinals because Tarek famously made it to MLG Columbus roundabout where he lost with CLG to Team Liquid, famously powered by Simple. It's also, most notably, the first ever title in CSGO of major variety for North America. The closest they'd ever come was Team Liquid made the final of ESL 1 Cologne 2016, if you remember with Simple Hard carrying them past Na'Vi and Fnatic, but them getting battered by SK in the final when SK went back to back. You had Complexity made the semifinals of DreamHack Winter 2013, the first ever CSGO major, also lost to the champion, lost quite heavily as well in the semifinals there to Fnatic of JW, Flusher and um, Pronax, but notably no Crimson Olaf at that point in time. That was actually an upset run even by Fnatic, <coughs> but not in that particular match. Now, this wasn't, in terms of the final, the biggest upset ever in CSGO history, or even in major history, quite frankly, because let's face it, Cloud9 were ranked fourth. I mean, if you actually saw on By The Numbers before this event, we picked who would the dark horses be to win the tournament. And when we said dark horses, we meant, right, take out the teams that are like clear favorites. So clear favorites would be FaZe because they had their proper lineup and they've won tons of tournaments and it's hard to beat them. SK, oh yeah, yes, sure they had a stand-in, but it's a stand-in they played with in the past. Plus it's SK, they can work with stand-ins, they've got so much experience, they've got Cold Zero for Fallen. Like they had the pieces to win. And then G2 we put in there because yes G2 is very streaky but their ceiling is really crazy and we know that's why they win events like Dream Act Malmo like ESL Pro League so we took those three teams out and then it was like right who else is your dark horse to win the tournament now yes you might say well technically you know if this team's ranked fourth they should be the next logical team right for him but that's the key thing Cloud9 had never even made a big final with this lineup they'd never won a tournament with this lineup they'd never beaten a team like FaZe never beaten a team like SK in a best of three so actually they were a team you could almost have bet on not to win in that particular sense meanwhile you know what elsewhere at least, you know, Astralis was getting device back. Maybe they could do something crazy. Obviously, classically being very good against SK. You obviously had Na'Vi with Simple going crazy and looked like they'd powered up a bit getting electronic. You had G2. Who, uh, well, uh, sorry, they already in the favorites. You had North in theory. Okay, yes, they've been in bad form, but they have the pieces. They have a very stable map pool. They have pretty good calling under pressure somewhat. You had even some of the outside more crazy teams, like 100 Thieves coming in with this hype from the boot camp. But I actually did pick Cloud9 because what I said was they, in theory, have the quality to do it. And I think as though if they get the right opponents, they could do it. Now, funnily enough, I obviously wouldn't have picked these opponents. But this is the key point. Even though they were ranked fourth, it was an upset. Not just in terms of the final, but the run that they made. In terms of the nature of who they played, how they beat them. But obviously, we'll get to all that later. So... Starting the major, because remember, this major was longer, because what used to be the major qualifier became the first week of the major. So we started, as Cloud9 did there, because they didn't make Legends spot the last major, in the new challenges phase, <coughs> stage rather. And in this stage, Cloud9 has an easy 3-0. And I mean easy, because they played Envious, but that was the Envious when RPK was really sick and they were in terrible shape anyway. They played Sprout, which is the team formerly known as Penta, but adding Dennis and Spitty. Not a good team. I think one of the worst teams in this major beyond some of the Asian and CIS teams. And then they played one legit game, which was against Mouse Sports, who's a pretty decent team. Obviously, ended last year on a high, almost winning ECS Season 4. Has a pretty decent map pool. I am a little bit surprised that Mouse opted to let Train be the map, because I think Train and Barrage really are nuts maps for Cloud9. But I understand why Cloud Mouse feel like at their peak, they have to play for their ceiling. And their ceiling is having nuts T-sides. And Oscar is a monster on T-side of that map. So, okay, legit win there. You got one legit map. You threw to the top 16. So in the new Legends stage, which is basically what used to be the first stage of the old majors, 
Cloud9 had a very tough time. They went down 0-2 to two and were always one game from elimination. They lost the opener to G2. Now, first of all, they shouldn't have been drawn against G2. That was a bullshit draw. This is why we need proper seeding. That should never have been possible. Because remember, G2 and Cloud9 are top five teams. So there's no way they should be getting drawn in the first round of a major. Meanwhile, elsewhere, if you remember, Quantum, Bellator, Fire were drawn against Virtus Pro. That's absolute bullshit, isn't it, when you consider these two matchups? So they got drawn against G2. The map ended up being Cash, a map that actually recently, for some reason, the G2 guys have been kind of flexed towards. Meanwhile, actually, Cloud9 seems like they don't particularly like that map with this iteration, and it was a dominant win by G2. Then they got an easier draw. They got Space Soldiers. Now, if you're going to be a team that's going to win the major or make a deep run, you should be able to beat Space Soldiers. But you know what? They played with fire. They let Space Soldiers get to Cobble. Cobble is a map that Space Soldiers have shown us something on in the past. Yes, you still wouldn't expect them to win. You still should think Cloud9 should have the quality to do it. But we saw in this tournament, Cobble was not a friend of Cloud9 like it had been in the past. For example, when they made that epic run with the old lineup to the EPL Season 4 Finals. I get the feeling that they thought their Cobble was decent from mainly NA results, but it wasn't international quality. So they were down 0-2, and two, and then it's all about the draw you get from that point in time. Because guess what? If you get an SK or a phase, you might be in a lot of trouble, you might be out. But luckily, they got Virtus Pro in their third game. Virtus Pro was having a terrible tournament. They got it onto Mirage, Cloud9's best map. Don't know what v Virtus Pro was thinking in that sense, but I guess Virtus Pro only plays a few maps now. Cloud9 won. Fair enough. Out goes Virtus Pro. Easy win, actually. Then the fourth game against Astralis. Now, interesting enough, they let it go to Train, which, yes, has been a very strong map. It's been a map that Astralis massively has put emphasis back towards recently, but this was not Astralis, quite frankly, because even though they got Device back, they swapped up his role, they had Debris stay on the AWP, they messed with it. They didn't go back to the old formation of what they used to have before. So, yes, Train was really good for the old Astralis, but is it the good, so good for this Astralis? I'm more skeptical. Meanwhile, it's still a very good Cloud9 map. Cloud9 won the game. Astralis looked pretty terrible, actually, and in fact, in this whole major looked terrible. Last map, they decided to get to the playoffs. Cloud9 get lucky. They draw Vega Squadron. I know people are thinking from earlier on, from the new uh, new challenges phase where Vega upset uh, FaZe. Like, oh, but Vega could do it. No, Vega's style matched up very good against FaZe. And in theory, I guess you could say they should have had a good chance against Cloud9, but one thing Cloud9 didn't really do in this tournament that FaZe did is FaZe early on and then late in the final had moments where they looked hesitant, where they second-guessed themselves, where they didn't may play to their normal style and therefore handicapped themselves and gave people an opening and teams that had the balls to pounce on it like Vega, like Cloud9, could do something about that. Mouse Sports as well, quite frankly, if you look at some of the trades that they had in that game on Nuke. Now, the problem here is Vega Squadron against Cloud9 doesn't work as much because Cloud9 play like Cloud9. And they got them up to Mirage, which, yes, even though Vega Squadron is normally very clever in the veto, this was a terrible veto. They should have tried to go elsewhere. Now, in this particular game, Cloud9 again move past. They get through the, the playoffs. But you know what? In this run here, getting battered by G2, beating a very bad VP, beating an Astralis that's kind of broken, and then beating Vega, who's cooled right off. Still nothing yet, aside from the win earlier against Mouse, to suggest that really G2, Cloud9's in that good form, quite frankly. So they come into the playoffs, nowhere near favoured to make the finals. Not even favoured to make top four. In fact, not favoured to win at all. They came in favoured to lose every series. Now, admittedly, that's because the top three favourites when you get into the playoffs were phase number one, far and away. SK number two, thanks mainly to the experience, etc. G2, not number two, thanks to their streaky form. And they hadn't really played many good teams recently. But still, G2, capable of a lot, looked hot in this tournament. Those are the top three teams. Now, obviously, in reverse order, going 3-2-1, Cloud9 ended up playing all of them. So in every series, they were genuine up underdogs. Now, against G2, yes, they weren't the craziest underdogs. Because, yes, G2 had been very hot. But as I, as I went to lengths to stress to people, like Richard on the on By The Numbers and people on my podcast, G2 had not played any top teams except Cloud9. Now, they played Cloud9, beat them on cash, but that's it. Aside from that, G2 had had a very easy run, actually. Now, they hadn't been tested, but as a result of not being tested as well, not having top opponents, I couldn't really know that they were in godlike form, quite frankly. Especially because, yes, Shocks looked great. Now, Shocks is a great player. That's fine. But NBK was posting mad numbers that NBK doesn't post over the last couple of years. Now, interesting enough, in this series, I already had my qualms when I saw the veto, because I think G2 fucked this veto up to a degree. Now, when G2 picked Overpass, that is okay, because actually G2 is a pretty decent team on Overpass. When they're at their best, they're good on Overpass. They've had big wins against teams like SK on Overpass. Then you look at the fact that C9 is actually traditionally weak on it. They came in something like, what? Like I think they were like 2-4 and four or 2-3 and three at the time on the map. They actually, funnily enough, G2 could have picked Cash instead 
of Overpass. That's why I actually have my qualms about it, because obviously it's the map that they already beat C9 on. It's a map that G2 was looking very good on. And in fact, as you saw later on, the guys from Cloud9 didn't seem confident about Cash and were glad they didn't get it in other series. Now, funnily enough, here's what's even more bizarre. G2 removed Cash themselves. They didn't make it the decider. Now, Cloud9 picked Mirage, understandably. It's their best map. It used to be the perma banner G2. Now, G2's improved a lot on it recently. But okay, if you're Cloud9, you've got to go with your best map pick if it's not the, one of the best map picks of the opponent and they're a favorite. I think that's fine. Now, funnily enough, this wasn't a classic series. It looked like it was going to be the best quarterfinal matchup. They played so many great games in the past. Should have been a real brawl. It was nothing like that. It was a very, very easy series for Cloud9. They won both first halves. They front run basically the whole series. They dominated. Rush was in monster form. He had 40 kills over the two maps. The whole team generally outfragged the G2 team, whereas that's supposed to be one of the strengths of G2 when they're on peak form is fragging. So G2 cooled right the fuck off. Kenny S was very quiet, obviously the best player on G2. Shocks had some decent plays. NBK, who'd been so hot earlier, was utter shit in this series and massively struggled. So there we go, Cloud9 completes their first upset, and they're through. Okay, one of the upsets that they were more favoured to get, but as in out of the three, but even so, it's still an upset, but whatever, top four, that's great. No one in the team had been to this point, to the tournament, that, to a top four in a major before. Great accomplishment already. Now they play SK Gaming. Now SK Gaming was also favoured. Now, yes, understandably, they have a stand-in. They haven't played with that stand-in for many months. They've had a lot of success without the stand-in. They've changed things up with the, the replacement player bolts. Phelps had had his issues towards the end. They were still facing top four often, except for that E-League Premier. So, yes, don't count them out like it's a stand-in in the traditional sense of a person who doesn't play with your team. But certainly they weren't truly SK. They weren't the scary team you thought was going to outright win the major as the true favourite, as they think they would have been if bolts had come with them. But... They have so much experience in that team. They have insane experience. They've been in so many major semis. They've been in major finals. They've won majors before. They've won so many tournaments. They have Cold Zero and Fo, seemingly never underperform when they get deep in tournaments and play against other teams. They have a lot of experience winning against Cloud9. They've done it so many times in the past. Now, there's also a factor that Cloud9, on the other hand, are not experienced at this stage. And by the way, it's very rare that you get these underdog teams that no one really chokes in the in the series or over the whole tournament, everyone plays well like they did here. The only ones I can really think of are like Gambit, the original Fnatic of 2015, uh, 2013 DreamHack rather, and then this Cloud9 team. Otherwise, even when you get an upset, you get the next round, you guess what, you get your head kicked in. So yeah, Team Liquid had some great runs to ESL1 Clone. What happened when they played SK in the final there? Utterly murdered. You know, complexity, as I said, beat Astana Dragons, the quarterfinals, number three team in the world, got to play Fnatic, who was actually like the number five or six team in the world, got utterly murked, had no chance in the game, got toyed with strategically, outfragged, looked looked quite, quite shook at times. You expect, especially with so many people who at this stage of the tournament are Rockies to that stage in the tournament, you expect one or two people are going to collapse. Meanwhile, you don't expect it from SK. So actually a lot of kind of intangible factors going SK's way. Then you got to add in, and by the way, just as a point, as I said, pressure in the spotlight did not affect Cloud9 in this tournament, except maybe Studio 2K in the first map of the final. And that is massively significant, because actually, like I said, the other great upset teams in history who won majors, Gambit, PGL Krakow 2017, Fnatic, Dream Act 20, 2013, because aside from that, we don't have massive upsets. We have just, you know, number two or number three team beats the number one team if there's an upset. Those also are teams that shared that quality where they didn't get affected by pressure and therefore could play their game and play to their max and actually above their normal level. And then that allowed when there were openings from the big dominant teams that they were supposed to lose to them to get those key wins. Now, in this veto against SK, we immediately started with an utterly bonkers ban because Cloud9 banned Nuke. A map that SK doesn't play, SK would never pick and would never pick with the stand-in. Now, funnily enough, Valens actually said in an interview later that he basically fucked up the, the ban here. This wasn't supposed to be their ban. So because they banned Nuke, it actually allowed SK, whose permaban is Nuke and who were definitely going to be banning Nuke, to remove Truck because they just banned it against Fnatic, who also have never played uh, Nuke with this lineup on LAN. It allowed SK to have a free ban. So SK just banned Train, which is one of the strongest maps for Cloud9. But I have to say, was telling a little bit of the psychology of SK because SK is supposed to be a good team on, team on Train. That's a map where we know that Fur and Fallen have a great time. So it's kind of bizarre to me that they were willing to ban that. That already told me that they weren't that, that confident as a team, perhaps. So the first map was um, Mirage. Now, Mirage is a map that, yes, Cloud9 looked amazing on when they played against G2, but G2 is not like the best Mirage team in the world. SK has always been very strong on Mirage, and particularly people like Cold Zero and Fur, some of the best T side players we've ever had on that map. So, on this map, 
SK starts out CT side. You think if they can just get seven, eight rounds, it's going to be their game, right? They get utterly battered. Cloud9 again, front run super heavily. They have a dominant 13 round T half. We're seeing them double smoke. Put smokes and flashes into spots instead of where you can just go across with one normally and save the utility. They're making sure they're adding in extra wrinkles. They're making it tougher to read what they're doing. They're very decisive when they do push on the sites. They get this monster T half. The game's pretty much won at that point in time. You go over to Cobblestone. Now, if Cloud9 was in true god mode, they probably would win this game here. But SK convincingly win this one. They win with just veteran savvy, quite frankly. Cloud9 did look, I wouldn't say shook, but they looked a little bit rattled in this one. Like, when they didn't get into it early and they didn't front run, that's when they kind of got, it seemed like their motivation got sapped a little bit. Their confidence in themselves got sapped. They tried, but I hate it where people are like, you can see they're just trying when it's like they don't really believe they're going to win the rounds. They looked a bit lost, quite frankly, on the T side on this map. And so, SK was dominant, wins the game, wins from the T side, actually. Well, they won the T side and then won from CT side. The decider being Inferno was a great move by Cloud9. I actually think this move right here, making Inferno the decider, is the main reason that allowed Cloud9 to win this major. Because without this being Inferno, I don't think Cloud9 gets past this series. But recently, well, we know Inferno was literally the reason why Phelps is no longer an SK Gaming starter and why they brought in Bolts. He was a liability. He had his issues. But funnily enough, it wasn't even on the CT side that we saw SK's problems because Cloud9 started on CT side and they were monsters. They had an insane front running 12 CT round half where they just made every big play. It looked easy for some of their players. Fallen, play, Fallen and the others tried to slow it down at times, tried to make reads. None of the reads were working. Obviously, we would see that CT side defense on Inferno would be a key factor for Cloud9 later in the tournament and something that they really had kind of, at least for this tournament, either hit a great... A great streak or figured out something in terms of timing and reads for because they were very good at staying at home and not overbiting on some of the rotations and therefore having people in position and not getting a mad numbers disadvantage which is what great in-game leaders want to do to you when they're on the t-side of inferno so they won this map quite frankly too easy i know sk started doing a comeback but they didn't get close enough to really put the pressure on so this was a little bit too easy but even so I'll take that. I'll take a win over a, t a team that's dangerous with with perhaps the greatest CSGO player ever and who've been in this position many times before. So inexplicably, they're through to the final. They've done it. They're in the final. That's already an accomplishment already. They've already matched the best NA accomplishment in major history. Now, funnily enough, in this SK series, we did see some factors that were very ominous and ended up being key for the final. First of all, Automatic went off in this series, which not only was reminiscent of the very famous ESL Pro League Season 4 finals in Brazil, where the old Cloud9 lineup beat SK Gaming, the one that had an FNX in the team, but also automatically being very up and down over the rest of the tournament since Tarek joined. Like, he would always get decent stats after the first few tournaments, but he was never that star player in the same way. So this was like, he was showing a real performance here that was like, okay, let's let's see what he can do in the final here because he's been a liability against FaZe in the past. Tarek was not just getting numbers, but he's getting a lot of big plays and doing it as an in-game leader, calling a scrimmy style, but at the same time also getting decent smokes and flashes off to make the scrimmy style more effective than just making plays on the map with individuals. Now, what was great about this series was the way that they won it because they won it not just in terms of on the right maps and making good choices there, but they had across the board good performances from everyone. Not that many great performances, but good performances from all the big players, including Skadoodle in this one. Now, SK had their chances. They got Fur back, who'd been terrible throughout the whole tournament at that point in time. Cold Zero fragged well, but his ADR was terrible. He had 65 ADR. You expect Cold Zero, even in a loss, to be like a 90 ADR player. This guy's usually so consistent. And in fact, on Inferno, he's the main reason on CT side why SK even had chances when they had the Fops on it before, because he's a monster over that A site. He really struggled here, really let himself down, quite frankly. And I think he was a reason as to why SK didn't make this a closer series overall. Fallen was crap for the whole series. Didn't do anything whatsoever. Didn't even call particularly well. Quite disappointing in that sense. Phelps struggled as well, but I will give Phelps the benefit of the doubt that he doesn't play with this team. They didn't practice with him. And they even explicitly said, we're going to put him in some of Bolts' spots and just make him do that. Then add in that they didn't ban Inferno second rotation. Therefore, they let Inferno come up. His nightmare map, the one that basically cost him his spot on SK Gaming. So, you know, what? I don't blame Phelps for struggling there. And very much better players than him struggled in this series. So they come to the final, and who are they facing? FaZe. Because FaZe was always going to be in the final of this tournament, which made sense from the beginning. They had everything going for them. FaZe were a huge favourite. Now, 
part of why they were a huge favorite was because they were playing Cloud9. They would have still been a favorite against anyone else, but they would have been a much more slight favorite against SK. They would have been a much more slight favorite against the G2 that could have made the final. Everyone, I think, except for Fnatic, they would have been a, 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 slight, um, a slight favorite against as opposed to a big favorite. What made them a big favorite here is that they've had so much experience beating and crushing Cloud9. They played Cloud9 in three best of three series with both these identical lineups over the last three or four months. They won all three of the best of three series, 2-0. Only one map ever got to double digits. And even then it was only 11 rounds. It was the last map that they'd, they'd played overpass at ECS season four in the group stage. FaZe was just winning at ease. It didn't even matter when C9 won the pistol rounds. Even when they had series where they won half the pistols and then won most of the pistols, FaZe was still winning at a canter. Then you've got to add in the maps. Cloud9 had lost both times they'd played Mirage. They'd even lost Train, which at the time wasn't even a strong map for FaZe. And then every time FaZe had picked the overpass and had won fairly easily, actually. So when you consider Mirage is a map that you need if you're Cloud9, it wasn't looking good going into this final. Then you add in across the tournament, FaZe had only lost a map to Vega Squad and in very unlikely circumstances against what looks like a slight kryptonite team in the group, in the new challenger stage. From the new legend stage on, FaZe won every single map, they even beat SK, and they just cruised to the final, except maybe that one map against Mouse on Nuke, not really a FaZe map, and yes, massively a Nuke map, uh, massively a Mouse map, so that's really the only struggle that they'd had. So everything said FaZe is going to win this one. You even look at the performances, okay, Cloud9 was having very good evenly distributed, great spread of performances, good impact, good role play, but not a lot of star power. No one really like standing out as the MVP candidate for the tournament. Meanwhile, FaZe had a whole... Be it's like they were lining up people. Like, who's going to win the MVP when we win this tournament, lads? They had Nico going God mode. Obviously, the true star player of the team. They had Olaf Meister, the guy who's not even a star in this team. Plays more of a supportive role. Mainly known for his Mirage play, quite frankly. Absolutely willing to be more of just a pure entry at times. He's a guy where he was having monster numbers up to the final. Guardian was just very, very solid. The best opera in the tournament by far. Again, looking like he could be an MVP for the final. Obviously, a guy who generally doesn't play badly in majors. And then you add in, Rain hadn't even woken up. Rain was actually underperforming, underfragging for his usual level. We know what a monster that guy is and what a monster he's been in the past against Cloud9. So if he'd have woken up, he could have won the MVP in the final. So you look at it and you think, you only need like two of these guys in phase to turn up. And surely they're going to have a massive chance, right? Now, when you get to the veto, again, it's looking amazing for FaZe because you get an identical first two maps as they've had in two of the three series, the first and the third that they'd played. You get Cloud9 picking Mirage and you get FaZe picking Overpass. Now, FaZe has smashed Cloud9 without Cloud9 even reaching double digits in all the past times. FaZe is still very good on Mirage. Then you go over to Overpass. FaZe has won all three times they've played on it. Cloud9 has won against G2 on Overpass. Okay, cool. That doesn't say that much, though. That's, that's not the end of the world that you've done that. It doesn't say you'll beat FaZe at that point in time. So it looked already like this is a clean 2-0 again for the guys from FaZe. Now, what was very clever, and this is what I love, is that again, Cloud9 flexed towards an Inferno decider. Because in this particular scenario, Inferno is a map that was so fucking good for the FaZe guys for the first, like, three or four tournaments. They were nearly unbeatable on it. They were the best team in the world on it. They looked like they'd got a pure read on the CT side that no one could fuck with. And so as such, add that to some of the pistol round streaks they've had in other tournaments, and no one could fuck with them on Inferno. But the last couple of tournaments, they've started to hemorrhage on, on Inferno. And they're still a good team on it, still a good map for them. But they're not that dominant force anymore. They're not that dominant CT force anymore. They've improved their T side to some degree. But even so, much more open map. So I like that Cloud9 made it. So if we get to a decider, if we can steal one of these first two maps, we've got a chance. Whereas we were against a team before where the decider in all three of the past seasons, which was never played, was cash. And actually, you saw Cloud9 get battered by G2 early in the tournament. You saw G2, uh, you saw FaZe smash SK on it. I mean, smash in terms of style, not in terms of score, but they com comprehensively outplayed them on that map. Looked like they really f were, were emphasizing that map a lot more. If that had been cash, that's a lot more squeaky bomb time for the guys from Cloud9, as far as I'm concerned. Not for FaZe. I think that would have been more comfort, actually. And it would have allowed them to make more individual plays and worry less about having to try and make some sick read and rotate like they did on Inferno. So I like the, the veto from Cloud9 here. I think it was very intelligent. So let's go through the series. Up comes Mirage. FaZe's best map, but Cloud9's best map as well. So you know what? They have a shot at it. It's going to have to be different from the from the past. Well, it was, wasn't it? Because every other time that they'd played against FaZe, the first map of every series they played, Mirage or Train, the first half of the map was always an 11 or 12 round win by the guys from FaZe. And most of the time, it was from the CT side. Well, funnily enough, Cloud9 starts T side. They get a big T half. 
and decisively play to put themselves in a spot to potentially win this game. They're in the lead. Now, FaZe, this is how they've shown what a different team FaZe is now from three months ago. They're no longer just that CT side team that can barely grind out the T side rounds. They were getting monster T rounds strong together here. They were playing massively off individual power, even though, and this is the crazy thing when you consider the comeback by FaZe, I think they won like 15 out of the last 20 rounds. So anyone, by the way, who's like, Cloud9 threw it, you don't throw 15 out of 20 rounds. Grow the fuck up, will you? Now, what's crazy, unless you, of course, want to say that FaZe threw the Inferno game, because FaZe had a big lead at certain times and Big Eat and Gromad Advantage and lost that game. I wouldn't say that they threw that game, by the way. Now, in this game, the reason also why it's scary is FaZe wins the map, like, 16-14, and that's with Nico getting 12 kills. And Nico is not only a very good player on FaZe, on Mirage for FaZe, usually on CT side, funnily enough, but he's the star player of FaZe, as far as I'm concerned, and was odds-on for the MVP coming into this final. So if he's only got 12 kills here, you think to yourself, okay, you won the map, he'll wake up on overpass, by the end of the series, he'll be on fire. Now, surely FaZe is going to win. Now, what I will say was a very good sign in, in this loss for Cloud9 was Skadoodle and Automatic had some really big players. And they are the two players who had struggled the most against FaZe in those past series. Now, Cloud9 had their own player who hadn't woken up and who struggled, which was Stewie2K, who had 12 kills himself, which is worrying. But you know what? Like Nico, you hoped, right? Let's hope he wakes up later. I mean, there was more of a question mark for him because even though both him and Nico have never made it deep in playoffs, Stewie's also someone where... Against the elite teams, uh, except for like the first sort of maybe seven or eight months in Cloud9, he's actually had his biggest problems against the elite teams. That's where he's kind of struggled because he has a very individual style. And I think that individual style hasn't worked like that kind of crazy pop yourself through a smoke style. People kind of know that's coming when they're the really elite players and passive players like Cold Zero and Nico just eat that shit up, quite frankly. So... Going into overpass, FaZe is looking like they're going to cruise and win the game. This is another map where not only does FaZe always win the T-half in massive numbers, but FaZe has even won T-halves with 11 rounds on this half on overpass against Cloud9. So they start on T-side because Cloud9 picks CT as they always had when they played the overpass against them in the past. I think, oh, at least two out of the three times. And Cloud9 gets the perfect half because they have a massive CT half. They're looking really, really good. FaZe is actually looking like they're expecting Cloud9 to just roll over and just give them the win, whereas they're not. cloud is playing really gutsy stuff. FaZe is looking like they're just expecting, like, what's going on? I thought we were just going to waltz to this game, and, and that's not what's happening at all. They're going very slow. Normally, they go slow, and they do make decisive plays. Like, what I love on this map is that FaZe always does, like, two-man faces. So what they'll do is they'll make, like, Rain and Nico face into you at the same time. So you can kill Nico or Rain, but the other one's going to get you on the trade. And doing that, they're going to surgically cut you apart just with AKs. Not about having a sick flash or an amazing smoke strat or completely making you rotate off the site on this map. They can just walk in and just trade their way two-man game onto the site, but not tr not even two-man game in the normal sense of like one runs in, you shoot him, and then the next guy peeks out. They pe double peek on you because they have amazing aimers. So two guys double peeking and both aim for your head. It's odds are they're going to beat you there. And that had always been the formula for having, yes, scrappy brawl games against Cloud9 in terms of kills, but always coming up with a lot more rounds than Cloud9 and always comprehensively heading towards that finish line and usually getting over there with somewhat relative ease and Cloud9 not even getting double digits. So that didn't happen at all here. And Cloud9 started to heat right up on that CT side. Now, when Cloud9 got on their own T-half, they looked pretty weak themselves. They, they weren't able to do a whole lot. FaZe really started to string rounds together, not least because Nico came to life. He started getting kills on that B site, so suddenly the B site was closed down, which was always the successful point for FaZe here. You had to force Cloud9 to the A site, and at the A site, you'd let the guys over there take care of business, usually with aggression early, and then playing uh, uh, towards the end of the game a little bit more passive. Now, what's great about this win, where Cloud9 won, and they actually won the most, the, the most clear-cut map of the series, was that, again, Skadoodle and Automatic were good. And this was showing this is a different Cloud9 look than we've seen at any of the past tournaments and ever against FaZe before. So we came to the deciding map. On this map, it started out, actually, this is the first map that started out like the other games that Cloud9 have phased in the, has played in the past. Because when they played all those other six maps in the past series, early on it would be close. Like, you know, this, a team would win a pistol, the other one would break them back. First sort of four or five rounds, there'd be breakbacks, back and forwards with four spies. Then FaZe would take over, assert themselves, dominate with star power. Now, here... That started out early on. It hadn't for the first two maps, but on this map, it started out like that. And actually, FaZe started to kick in the gear more after the first period. And it looked like, right, this is looking like FaZe. Now, they didn't win the win by it much on the CT half, but they got the eight rounds. Then they won the T pistol up nine to seven on T half. Now, they're a much improved T side team. <coughs> but this is where 
That's Cloud9 SK Gaming performance with the Monster CT side became so crucial because they were going to have to do that again. They were going to have to hold their nerve against a really good team. And crucially, the key adaption they made, there was two that they made, in the, three they made in this game. One, they stayed at home late when FaZe was doing very weak fakes to try and draw a man over. Two, they didn't let FaZe bait out all the utility. FaZe's style against the likes of a Cloud9 is always go very slow on T side, throw all your utility, the enemy throws all their utility in response, tries to delay you, everyone's got no utility, go in dry with double faces, and now guess what? With super, super fucking good AK players like they have, you're going to win tons of rounds against another skill-based team like Cloud9. They don't exactly have the most insane, like, setups in the sites. They tend to just play off aim spots like like a budget phase, quite frankly. Now, Cloud9 didn't do that. They were very, very disciplined in not wasting their utility and saving some of it towards the end. And then if FaZe tried those risky, very late pushes with not a lot of time on the clock, now Cloud9 was in position to make a lot of plays. Then the third thing that happened, actually, let me think, was that the third thing? What would the third thing be? I think I've forgotten the third thing. <laughs> uh, I don't know. We'll see if it comes to me again. Uh... In this game, we had the game early on on T side massively heads towards phase. In fact, after all that Cloud9 has done, almost winning Mirage, playing really well on overpass, overcoming the comeback from phase there, this game, when it gets to 13 8, looks like it is all but done for Cloud9. Anyone who thinks that like Cloud9 was still in a great position doesn't understand the economical component of the game, doesn't understand the side skew bias with these particular teams playing the map right now. Because at 13-8 for FaZe, FaZe has money, FaZe has a full buy, and Cloud9 forces with two CZs, one UMP, and two AKs. That should be the end of the game. Not least because... It should be the end of the game even if you lose that round because you've got so many rounds of your phase. You don't have many to get at this point in time. Cloud9's money is going to be weak the whole way out, so they can't really afford to lose any rounds at that point in time. And even when they win this round, who, are they really going to win it with that many guns saved? You don't think so, but amazingly, they had a really great round. They actually won quite dominant fashion. FaZe kind of fucked it up. FaZe looked like they were in pretty terrible fashion, and Cloud9 made all the key kills that they needed to and played like a team that weren't just going to go out like they normally would, like a normal lesser team would at this point in time and go, well, we gave our best chance, oh, we should have won Mirage. They were still in this game mentally, and that's the key part. And you would see throughout this tournament and throughout this final... They laid a lot of the big, like, we're in a tough spot, let's make a crazy play to get out of it and be decisive. That's one of the best qualities of Cloud9 in this final. Decisive, willing to take risks. So, 13-8, all of a sudden, we're at 14-9. So, okay, FaZe has reasserted control. They only need two out of the remaining, let me think, seven rounds. And they're on T-side, they're a pretty good T-side team. That's fine, that's still doable. And you know what? They get to 15 rounds. It goes to 15-11. And at 15-11... This, oh, this is the third point that I forgot to mention before. The third thing Cloud9 did was late in the game at the 26th round, 27th round, Cloud9 decided to put a second AWP in the game. So they had Skadoodle with an AWP, and now, he obviously plays at A, now they put Stewie2K, who played at B, with an AWP as well. And this was a key adaptation for the guys from Cloud9. Funnily enough, this is actually kind of poetic justice because if you remember the old phase lineup with Alu and Kiyoshima won a game that 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 um, Astralis were at championship point on a deciding inferno at star series season three finals by themselves going to a double op with a player at the b site which was nico and that was a big factor and obviously they had Alu at the a site with an op that was a big factor as to why they were able to hold and win a game in overtime in fact double overtime i think themselves so funnily enough phase kind of got phased themselves didn't they now at this point in the game double op was a, both a key component from there on out for cloud nine and was a big reason as to why all these fakes towards b where they were trying to just bang in with three or four people because if you go in and th those are just rifles there I'll take three or four phase players smoking off to the right and going in four versus two against guys who are separated with M4s. It's a better gun, the AK. They've got better aimers on the side of phase. That's just a fantastic scenario. You, you don't even need utility. You can go in dry at that point. I can see why phase thought it would work, but cloud Nine sticking with the AWP, and obviously Stewie's not a primary AWP, but he likes to use it sometimes. This was a key moment that won cloud Nine this game. Now, obviously, notably at 15-14, Still match point. FaZe has one last chance to win the tournament. FaZe does a rush B, but they did it way too late. They waited too long when actually Cloud9 had already bitten on the fake. But Cloud9 had bitten on the fake, 
because they didn't look at there was enough time left. So at seven seconds is when the first phase player hit the little steps going into the B site. That's too late. You can't afford for the first guy to get killed there. He can't know where the first CT is. The first CT might be able to kill him and then he's going to have to switch to the others. You just made it too risky there. They really fucked up the timing on that one. But you know what? That's not the main reason they lost that round. The main reason they lost that round is, first of all, Cloud9 didn't bite on the fakes, didn't over-rotate initially, didn't use all their utility initially, and then Stu2K got a monster, I think it was a three kill or something, to close that out and make it overtime. Now, in overtime, it was Cloud9's chance to get the championship point. But at championship point, one round left to go, Guardian got a sick 1v2. And then with an M4, by the way. Guardian's an AWPer. Guardian's a Deagle player. But what a great play that was from Guardian. What clutch play. The positions Cloud9 were in, I think Cloud9 fucked it up a little bit. Guardian should not have been able to win from those positions. Like, that's classic where even if you kill the first guy, the second guy is definitely going to kill you in that situation. What balls from this guy. What great poison of pressure. And by the way, this is a great example in terms of Guardian of a player who did not deserve to lose this match. He, As far as I'm concerned, in terms of his individual play, he did everything that an MVP of the whole tournament and of this final needs to have done he was sick in that map he was sick in that series and i feel so bad for him that he lost because it's the same shit that happened to him when he was in navi when they played against envious in the final except this time he was favored and he lost now in the end cloud nine wins 22 to 19 double overtime now what's crazy about this was the worst player for cloud nine over the tournament was skadoodle in fact the worst player for Cloud Nine of the tournament at the end of the tournament as well is skadoodle but in this series the best player for Cloud9 was Skadoodle. Now, not in terms of, like, making the crazy clutches or all the big... I, although he did have some good 1v1 up clutches, or making all the ridiculous shots. No, what made Skadoodle the best player overall was, first of all, he added something they didn't have elsewhere and very rarely ever have when he's on the team. Secondly, he had really good poison under pressure. So what he would do is he wouldn't have insane rounds where he killed everyone, but he'd get really big one or two kills that were, like, middle-of-the-round kills that prevent the execute coming in and phase doing those bully tactics of, like, three guys just rushing you straight up dry with AKs out, all three aiming at you, and you have one or two guys there who have the numbers disadvantage, the weapons disadvantage, and now are facing a really scary prospect and probably going to get traded on anyway. He got a lot of kills there. Funnily enough, he actually missed tons of flicks. This wasn't like Skadoodle 2014 or 2015, who was a monster at all types of orping. He actually missed a lot of the kind of like really fast reaction shots, even on the people in the side, etc. But he hit seemingly everything close to mid-range. And obviously a map like Inferno, you're going to get a lot of mid-range action if you want as an orper. You can choose the, ref the distance when you're CT side on that map. Stewie2K had some hero plays, as mentioned before. He really came alive and redeemed himself for that first map, which could have lost in the tournament outright. Tarek had monster impact plays all over the map, and I was very impressed, presumably, by some of his calls not to rotate on the CT side. Also, obviously, had a great T side on Mirage. I think that, funnily enough, what I loved about this game was that Cloud9 actually won this map, uh, this game, playing NA style Counter-Strike. They did push through smokes. They did, when what would happen is when FaZe threw their utility like smokes, like flashes, they would hold on the other side, playing passive lurk angles, waiting for the smoke to dissipate so that then they could just take a shot into the guy there or they could peek out or they could see if they could draw a flash or a defensive smoke from the CT straight after theirs went out. Instead, players like Tarek, like Stu2K, like Automatic would push through these smokes, make information plays, get kills, get crazy kills themselves. I mean, there was one that phase I'd like that where they had the Nico one. Okay, crazy in its own right. But they played what you think of as that rank S style. And guess what? It worked. So you know what, Moses? That rank S style's got something to it. Now, listen, it hasn't in as much as it hasn't won many tournaments and probably won't ever win another major again. But you know what? For this one glorious day, it fucking worked when everyone was playing on in their form. And FaZe did whatever FaZe was going to do, and Nico, for whatever reason, didn't turn up. Now, Cloud9 wins the game. What a fucking epic game. One of the best series I've ever seen, particularly, though, the third map. Let's not say the whole series, because Overpass wasn't that great, quite frankly. But the third map, one of the best single maps we've ever seen in CSGO, and absolutely the best single map we've ever seen in the final of a major, I think. Although, you could put a couple up there, but we'll go into that in another video or an article. I especially think the fact that they came back from such insane odds in that third map, and over the series overall, in terms of the maps they were facing and who they were facing, I think that just makes it an amazing accomplishment. I think Guardian, personally, was the MVP of the tournament, because MVP is not just about the final, although I could make an argument Guardian was the best player of the final, it's about the whole tournament. And for the whole tournament, Skidler was in no way even close to the MVP. So yes, he was the MVP of Cloud9's final, that's a different factor, though. It's not a finals MVP award. Guardian was the MVP of the tournament. Rain as an overall player, by the time the final was finished, played pretty well. Olaf 
was never going to be a monster fragger like he was elsewhere in the tournament. That guy does not choke though. That is a fact. That guy always plays with balls, does his job. I think he did a pretty good job. He's another player I feel bad for. The two players I think really let the team down. Carrigan had some terrible calls late on T-side of Inferno where he never made the read or figured out that Cloud9 weren't biting on these fakes. And he kept doing not just fakes, but very weak-willed kind of like just like half fakes that I, not, I wouldn't buy. They just didn't didn't look like scary in any way. I mean, part of them he also hoped would then draw utility, which never happened. So he was thinking, well, what do I do now? And all he tried to do often was either brute force B or do really dodgy rotates back over the other side where you do them too slow and therefore the team makes a read on that as well. Then you've got to add in that the biggest factor, I think, that actually cost FaZe's final, because remember, they were on championship point for the, for the final. Let's be real, they could have won this final was Nico choked. Now, I know he turned up for the second half on overpass, and he had some big rounds on Inferno, but this was not Nico. This is not the guy I've seen elsewhere in the tournament. This is not the guy I've seen for the last two years. I know it was his first big final. I know it was his first major playoff, so we give him a break. He is 20 years old. You know, he's also a guy playing in an international team. He doesn't play with people from his region. So all reasons we can give him a break. But you know what? At the same time, it's not acceptable. Like, even if he goes on to win five majors, guy could do it. We're still going to look back and go, you could have had this one, mate. You fucked this one up. This was a learning lesson. This was like you had to fall and be broken in this final, hopefully then to be reconstituted as a greater player, even still going forwards. Because Nico was the big sore spot for FaZe overall, beyond some of Carrigan's calls. Now, what does it mean that Cloud9 won this final? Right. First of all, the way that it, they relied on Skadoodle to do so is a big concern, quite frankly, because I'm not just saying that that's unlikely to happen again. It won't happen again. Like, maybe it'll happen for the odd series. It's happened in the past, but it tends to happen earlier in the tournament against lesser opponents. It doesn't happen against the elite-level teams usually. So I would go ahead and say it won't happen again. I mean, like I say, even in this performance, he wasn't hitting all crazy flick shots everywhere. He was just getting a lot of the really solid shots, and he played really well under pressure. Automatic change for this tournament. Also something of a concern, but I always thought Automatic's a good player, so... Maybe he's just getting more attuned to Tarek's style. That one we'll kind of wait and see for the next tournament on. Tarek and Stewie are still money. I know Stewie kind of choked in the first map of the final. It's a dude's first ever major playoffs. He's also a very young player. He's someone who has even less experience in big finals than someone like fucking Nico does overall. So when you consider for the to whole tournament, I think Tarek and Stewie are fucking money. I don't mean money at this tournament. They're money overall. And what I like as well is neither of them have to be the star on this team because they've got a great spread. And crucially, they seem to have the same philosophy on, on making those aggro individual plays, but also on having clever smokes to set up those plays so you're not just going in dry. Rush is just a soldier, just does his job. Really glad to see him win after I felt he was the guy most hard done by when Stanislaw left Optic because people forgot that he was a good player. Now, funnily enough, if you win the major, just like Gambit won the major, you think to yourself... Well, are they going to win tournaments now? You just won the World Championship. No, just like Gambit, probably aren't going to win tournaments. Now, here's that. Unlike Gambit, I actually think that this team can win tournaments, but I think they would win them more G2 style if they had amazing performances from multiple players like they did here. It's just that, you know what? That hasn't typically happened with this lineup. They've been more consistent. They tend to beat the teams below them, but not the teams above them. I would say the teams above them, the FaZe and SKs of the world will beat them next time they play them. Don't know yet about where G2 is going to be at. If Astralis gets their shit together, Astralis probably should beat them overall. So I would say, again, they'll settle in where they, where they were before this tournament, fourth or fifth, and that's about where they should be in the world. Still kind of cool, though. And the one thing I do want to see is, has their overpass really improved? Because if their overpass has really improved and that this wasn't just a one-off tournament or phase shit in the bed, G2 shit in the bed, then that's what's going to make it interesting because now they'll have a map pool. Now they'll have Mirage, Train, and Overpass and maybe some Inferno. Now you're starting to get a crazy map pool, because if you have those four maps, now maybe you can win some series and maybe some tournaments. Now, the firepower probably still means probably not, but that starts to open the door to a different Cloud9, because that's the key thing. It has to be a different Cloud9. Now, are Cloud9 the best NA team of all time? Yes, I reckon. I reckon you have to say so, because look at this run here. They beat G2, they beat SK, they beat FaZe. Like I said, Third favorite for the tournament. Second favorite. Third favorite for the tournament. You get a fucking third favorite. Second favorite for the tournament. Yeah, that's right. And phase the, the number one favorite. So that's epic. They didn't get any easy opponents here in the playoffs. They didn't cakewalk the way there. Like, you know what? Gambit beat for Astralis last time, but then they beat busted up Fnatic and they beat, quite frankly, underwhelming Immortals in the final. So I think this is one of the best underdog runs. In fact, it's the best underdog run we've ever seen to win a major. So crazy performance by Cloud9. I think it's also kind of fitting that this lineup won the major because this lineup took some of the best elements of Optic, some of the best elements of Cloud9, 
put them together, developed a style that was very much an NA style and very much fit the star players and, and the, the leading thinkers of the teams, Stuart UK, Tarek, and actually allowed them to win in a fashion where someone like Skadoodle didn't end up being a liability in this particular match. So I think it's kind of cool that they won in NA style and that, yes, Optic had to die to do it in terms of as an NA team, but we got a better team out of it as a result, and now NA are major champions. Machine here, and you're watching Thorin's YouTube channel. 20-minute video for two minutes worth of content. Gold. I've created a Patreon, so if you're interested and able to support my work financially, then check out the link in the description box below and become a part of the Skrilluminati today.